Well, good evening. Good evening, good evening, good evening. This is Harry Brown, and this is the Radio America Network, and this is July 3rd, 2004, the day before, what is it tomorrow? Oh, it's the 4th of something, 4th of July, independent something or other. Oh, well, in my neighborhood, out in the country, outside of Nashville, fireworks have been going on for the last several hours. They finally died down, fortunately, or you'd be hearing them all the time in the background, and you wouldn't be able to hear me, and that would be a disaster. And, of course, over this weekend, we hear a lot on radio and television about the 4th of July and what we have to be thankful for and all of that. And I think we do have a lot to be thankful for because of the kind of country that was established here in the late 1700s. It took a long, long, long time for the government to approach the kind of control over its people that was taken for granted in European and Asian countries. But we are slowly getting there. But because we had such a head start, we are still in much better shape than many countries of the world and many countries of the past. But it's interesting that most people today have not been alive long enough to remember what America was like before the government became all-encompassing in this country. If you could go back just 40 years, I remember in the election of 1960, the issues that were discussed and argued over were nothing compared to the issues that are being discussed this year. There was no discussion of health care in 1960. There was a minor discussion about bringing the federal government into education. John F. Kennedy wanted the government to subsidize school construction and teacher salaries around the country. Richard Nixon, his Republican opponent, said, oh, no, 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 no. We must have the government subsidize school construction, but not teacher salaries, because then the government would gain the power to tell teachers what to teach. Well, after Kennedy was elected, they had arguments about this in Congress, and a lot of Southern Democrats were somewhat conservative, and conservative meant something much more than conservative really did mean smaller government. And the result was that the Republicans won the argument, and federal aid to education was limited to just school construction. Ha, ha, ha. That lasted a few years, and then the government got into subsidizing teacher salaries, and then the government surprise, surprise, started making rules for what the schools must do and what they should do and so on. And now, of course, the candidates all have great ideas about how the schools should be run from Washington to solve all the problems that 40 years of government intrusion into the schools has caused. Well, going back again to 1960, the federal budget then was $80 billion. That's approximately one-thirtieth of what it is today. Can you imagine $80 billion? And I can tell you this, that in 1960, I thought the government was way too big. The government was way too intrusive, way too nosy. And yet, I tell you, I would gladly, gladly trade what we have today for what we had in 1960, even if it meant bringing the Cold War back. But in those days, life was so much different in the United States. The government controlled so much less of the economy. The government controlled so much less of our incomes. And people today don't realize that the federal government wasn't involved in health care at all, and health care cost a fraction of what it did, uh, does today. Hospital stays cost a, maybe a week's pay instead of several months' pay. Doctors could actually make house calls, stop by your home, and check in on you on their way home from work. Education uh, was so much better then than it was now. It was always a government subject because local governments provided education since the middle of the 1800s. But even though we had government running the schools, by and large, students came out of the schools knowing how to read and write, knowing a lot about history and geography. I graduated from high school in 1950, and I was a terrible student. I'm surprised I even graduated from high school. In fact, I almost didn't. But I learned so much about the world just by sitting in class. I soaked up a great deal of information. What was bad about the schools in those days was that, just as was the case from the advent of government schooling in the middle 1800s, was that I learned that I was supposed to be a good citizen and that I should worship the United Nations and that I should understand that government is responsible for so much good in this country and big business would drive us up the wall if it weren't for government regulating it. And FDR got us out of the Great Depression and things of this sort. It was the citizenship part of it that was so bad. But after the 1960s, when the federal government got in, then we saw the academic side of education go downhill as well. And now students don't read or write as well. They don't add or subtract as well. They know much, much less about history. And they know even more now about the importance of recycling and how big business is destroying the environment and how we must all pull together to do the things. So the citizenship part has gotten worse, and the academic part has degraded tremendously. Young people today don't realize that 40 years ago, the federal government wasn't even involved in welfare. There were virtually no federal welfare programs. It was the war on poverty in the mid-60s that thrust 
the federal government into welfare, and from that time forward, the welfare rolls began, began to mushroom because before then, welfare was some little office in the back of the city hall that took care of indigent people until they could get back on their feet. It was not a career choice as it is today. Crime was different then because local police departments focused on doing away with violence, of stopping violent offenders. There was crime, of course. There will always be crime in any society because there will always be people who will try to shortcut, people who will try to get what they want without having to work very hard for it. But crime was a fraction of what it is today because the police focused primarily on violent criminals, on stopping the violence in society. They were not enforcing racial quotas. They were not enforcing drug laws. They were not involved in... Uh, special situations like hate crimes and so forth. And as a result of that, the police had the facilities, the resources, and the manpower to do something about violence. It is always possible for a free society to keep violence to a minimum. But when you have a welfare state where the government is using the police to enforce all kinds of dicta, of all kinds of social policies, then you are always going to be short of the resources necessary to be able to stop violence. And as a result, we have a much, much higher crime rate now than we did uh, 40 years ago. As a matter of fact, in I'm, I don't have the information at hand, but I believe it was 1941, there were 140 homicides, homicides in the city of New York. About 10 years ago or five years ago, New York celebrated the fact that the homicide rate was down to 1,400, 10 times as much. Well, you say, the population is greater now, but in fact it isn't. New York City has no more people in it today than it did back in 1941, but it has 10 times the number of homicides, and that homicide rate is celebrated as a great triumph of Rudy Giuliani as the mayor of New York. And, of course, one of the big problems in the crime world is the drug war. It's hard to believe young people don't realize that in, 19, in the 1950s, drugs were not an issue in this country. Uh, we had drug laws, but they were enforced more in the breach than in anything else. People did smoke marijuana if they wanted to, but not many people wanted to. But when the drug war heated up in the 1960s, suddenly it became profitable for people to deal in drugs because the black market always creates unrealistically high prices once it's no longer legal. Well, you can go even back further than the 1960s, go back 100 years when there was no income tax, when America was not the world's policeman, and people around the world were not scared to death of Americans, and America were not, Americans were not scared to death of people around the world. That is the meaning of the 4th of July, a country in which the government is so small it can fit into your garage, a country that minds its own business, a country in which the federal government abides by the Constitution only occasionally overstepping the line, a country in which the Bill of Rights means something, a country in which you can't lock up a bunch of people in Guantanamo Bay without charging them with anything or allowing them to have access to an attorney without allowing them to communicate with their families. This is what America was, was a country in which people had individual liberties that were unheard of in the rest of the world. And that's why we have the Statue of Liberty, the symbol of freedom, the hope and inspiration providing light to the world, the idea that if it could happen in America, then it might happen in your country. And that's why the French, on their own, without the help of their own government, contributed to create the Statue of Liberty and send it to America in gratitude that Americans had given us this kind of world. If we could only bring back that America, it would mean so many things. It would mean, number one, You'd have a lot more money to spend on the things that mean something to you rather than sending bombs and troops to Iraq. You would have the ability to take care of your own retirement and not have the government take 15% of your pay to put it into a bankrupt, fraudulent scheme like Social Security. Crime would be far, far less in your city. Your children would be much better educated. Health care would be much less expensive, and health insurance would be much more available than it is today because the main reason that people are uninsured is that the government has run up the price of health insurance out of the reach of so many people by loading up the insurance companies with all sorts of mandates that they must add to every insurance policy. Maybe if you're a single man, you don't want abortion coverage in your insurance policy. Maybe if you are a nun, you don't need child care in your health care policy. Who knows? In any event, let's see what's going on around the country. Let's talk first with Kayleen in Boston, Massachusetts, or near to Boston, Massachusetts. Good evening, Kayleen. Well, hello, my esteemed Mr. Brown. Well, hello, my esteemed <laughs> Kayleen. Um, I absolutely agree with you uh, about government regulation of practically every aspect of our life. It's ridiculous. Public schools, regulation everywhere. I spoke to you last week about um, JACO and mm -hmm. that being a non-government uh, group, which is a an industry standard. Um, the healthcare institutions want to meet their standards because otherwise the consumers will say, well, if you don't meet the standard, then I don't want to put my grandmother in your nursing home or mm -hmm. whatever. Yes, and there are so and, many uh, organizations like that, so mm -hmm. many sources of mm -hmm. private regulation that people can turn to mm -hmm. when they don't know what's good and what's bad. Exactly, and 
when I said industry regulation, I you know I meant demand from consumers. Sure. Meaning the industry um, regulates itself by consumer demand. But I absolutely agree with uh, uh, the government just needs to get out of our our lives. Um, stop going up our well, you know what. <laughs> yes. And um, public school. Uh, I moved to a small town when I was uh, when my daughter was very young. Um, and one of the main reasons that I moved to it was, oh, the public school system is the most wonderful one in the state. And it went downhill, 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 and my daughter just graduated this year. And I'm surprised that she graduated and learned anything because it was so horrid. Uh, and I believe that if I had no income tax to pay because I work full time, I would have put my daughter through a private school and she would have gotten a much better education. Um, and victimless crime is another thing that you were talking about before, mm -hmm. putting uh, drug addicts in jail. Um, things like that. It's Using up the resources to uh, prosecute victimless crimes, and that means that violent criminals get off with exactly. early release and plea bargains exactly. because of a clogged up law enforcement and clogged up prison system. Mm -hmm. yeah, for, for every drug addict that they, they put in jail, uh, we were, I've discussed this with many people, and uh, I've tried to uh, subtly get them to um, realize the libertarian ideal. Um, okay, what two drugs kill the most people? Alcohol and cigarettes, the two legal drugs in this country. Mm -hmm. And yet... We have all the other drugs that are illegal, and we're throwing people in prison because they use these drugs. They're not hurting anyone else. They're just using or selling these drugs. They are victimless crimes, and yet for every person that they put in the prison for using drugs or selling these drugs, they're laying out a rapist, a murderer, a child molester, violent people. Yes. Thank you very much, Kayleen. I appreciate your comments. And I will point out also that more people have died because the FDA has withheld life-saving medicines from the market that have been available freely in other parts of the world and not causing any problems. Absolutely. More people have died that way than from all the illegal drugs in Absolutely. the last century. So thanks very thank much you. for calling, Kayleen. And thank you. I do want to say that, of course, what we have to recognize always is that the difference between government and individual liberty is the issue of force. The only reason a law is passed, the only reason a regulation is promulgated, the only reason a program is turned over to the government is in order to use force. Every government program, every law, every regulation involves the use of force. Either some people are being forced to do what they don't want to do, or they're being forced to pay for something they don't want to pay for, or they are being forcibly prevented from doing what they do want to do. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a government activity. The only reason you turn to government is because you feel that voluntary methods have failed, that other people have not done what you wanted them to do. Other people have not behaved the way you want them to behave. And so you turn to the government and say, we need a law about this. And then people who do not obey, people who do not do as they're told, people do, who do not pay for what you want them to pay for can be fined or put in jail. And that's what government is all about. The essence of government is the gun and the police power. And when you ask the government to pass a law, to promulgate a regulation, or to undertake a program, you're saying, I want the government to have the police go make people do what I want them to do. Otherwise, you would just be writing letters to the editor, giving speeches, standing on uh, street corners and preaching or whatever it is, trying to get people to do what you want them to do voluntarily. The only reason we turn to government is to use force. And Rick uh, sent me an email in which he said, I recently read a column written by Lou Rockwell Jr. in which he said, quote, if force does not work, government does not work, which, of course, is a truism because government is force. And he says you also frequently mention on your shows that government does not work. There must be something about the mechanism of government and its use of force that does work. After all, our world has been plagued with the mischief of governments and the wars that come with them now for thousands of years. There is a pattern. If nothing about them has been working, then through the concept of necessity, they should have ceased to exist a long time ago. Just maybe the real purpose of governments all along has been to shatter civilizations into little pieces just so the process of picking up the pieces can start all over again. When government grows, it carries a big hammer. Well, I think what we need to realize is that prior to a few hundred years ago, and not even that long ago, people generally recognized that government was their enemy, that government consisted of the people that were able to conquer the country. And when I say conquer, I don't mean foreigners necessarily, but people within the country who were able to gain the mechanism of force and use it to their advantage. Generally speaking, of course, in places like England, they thought that the kings had some kind of divine right, and they were able to bring themselves to respect the king and so forth. But that was primarily because kings were smart enough in many cases, if not most cases, 
to leave people alone, to take only what they needed to live lavishly and have a court and to be able to do what the kings wanted to do. The kings did not presume to know what was best for their subjects in the sense that they would impose some kind of government-created health care system on them or impose government education on them or a government welfare system. That was not what kings did. And so where kings were relatively benevolent like that, people were willing to let the kings stay there as long as they were left alone. Where the kings or other forms of of leader, czar, kaiser, whatever you want to call them, were tyrants, then people knew them to be their enemies. And when the colonists in America revolted to secede from the British Empire, they considered the king of England to be a tyrant because he was imposing taxes that were taking, oh, almost 1% of the American income was being siphoned away by the British government in taxes. Can you imagine such tyranny? And they wanted to set up a government in this country that would do the things that they felt government had to do, protect them from foreign enemies, and impose a certain modicum of order on the country, but not take away the liberty that they felt was inherent and a right in every individual. And what they composed did a pretty good job for roughly 100 years, but pretty soon politicians began to tread on the Constitution in ways that eventually just shredded it and made it meaningless. Today, what we have, of course, are behind us is over 150 years of government schooling teaching us that we can't get by without government, that if it weren't for government, big business would be running roughshod over us. If it weren't for government, every other country in the world would be using America as a battleground to fight their battles with each other. If it weren't for government, people would be dying of starvation in the streets. If it weren't for government, we would have anarchy in this country. Well, I mean to tell you that wherever you look at the free market in operation, you do not see anarchy. What you see is competition. What you see is constant change. What you see is development, but you don't see anarchy. Where you see the government in charge, you do see anarchy. You see complete chaos, uh, whether you're talking about the welfare system, whether you're talking about education uh, and the schools that have to have metal detectors, where you look at the airports that are run by the government and you see long lines of people waiting to be frisked. Uh, what you see is not order and progress. What you see is retrogression and in many, many cases, pure chaos. The one rule that is hard for people to grasp but is very, very important, and I think it is the rule that distinguishes a libertarian from other people, and that is the realization that whatever it is that people might be afraid of, whatever it is that people are concerned about, whatever it is that people need desperately, whatever it is that people find at fault with the people who supply them with their goods and services now, whatever the shortcoming, whatever the problem, whatever the fear, this represents an opportunity for someone else to make a profit, someone who knows better how to handle this situation. And that person is going to use that opportunity to make things right. So whatever it is you're afraid of might happen in the free market. Just remember that there will be not just one, not just two, not just ten, but maybe a hundred, a thousand, or ten thousand people out there who know more about it than you do who will want to rush to your aid to take care of whatever that problem is. And they will compete with each other on the basis of who can do it for the lowest cost, who can do it in the most reliable way, who can guarantee his work, and who can give you the most of what you want. That's how the free market works. People all the time looking for opportunities to solve other people's problems. What we have with government, when we turn something over to the government, is political issues. Whatever it is, a medical problem, a scientific problem, a commercial problem, a financial problem, a military problem, turn it over to the government, and it is now a political issue to be decided by whoever has the most political influence. And that's not going to be you, and it's not going to be me. And there isn't anybody there in Washington who is rushing to come to your aid because of a problem you can't seem to solve. All right, enough of me. Let's go to California now and talk with George. George, I'm sorry to, that we have kept you waiting so long. Are you still with us? I sure am, Harry. It's great to talk to you. Um, I, I just wanted to tell you I've been a lifelong libertarian and... Uh, Outside of Thomas Jefferson, you're one of the few people that's uh, really influenced me in uh, this type of philosophy. Um, what I wanted to talk about tonight was, uh, concerning what you're talking about, the growth of government and how government truly is uh, something once it's become so large uh, that destroys civilization instead of promotes it, uh, which I believe is true. But I wanted to wrap into that basically and ask you, is, I want to talk a little bit about the future of the Libertarian Party. I've been a lifelong Libertarian, and I do think the Libertarian Party as a political ve vehicle is probably uh, the best one that's, that, that is out there and the one that speaks for people like myself and yourself and other people who believe in freedom. But the thing I'm concerned about is within the party, and I recall I was listening to your archive show a couple weeks ago, and there was a guy who left the party after he disagreed with abortion. Um, and what I was going to ask you was, is how do we create a, a more unified party to get the things that we want done, basically, when we have people within the party that are so busy savaging it? You know, you have these, you know, the anarcho-capitalists, you have um, the objectivists, you have all these different people that are more hell-bent on destroying the party than moving it forward like people like yourself. And it, it, you know, I'm not saying the Libertarian Party is the only hope. There are other groups out there. There are other websites, other people active. But I know it's, it's really tragic to see that because I really do think it's the best hope. Mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying. Well, first of all, 
the law requires that if you're going to have a political party, it must be a membership organization. Otherwise, you can't get on the ballot. So you can't organize the party the way you would a business and say, well, here we are. Here is the board of directors. Here is the executive director, the CEO, and so forth. And this is the way things are going to be done. And if you don't like it, you just don't have to join. So it has to be organized as a membership organization where people vote. And anytime you have a membership organization, not just political parties, but the Elks Club, the Rotarians, whatever it may be that's organized that way, you're going to have the very things that you were talking about. You're going to have people who are there only to snipe at everybody else. You're also going to have people who are so sure they're right about either the ideology or the strategy that must be followed, that they are so right that the ends justify the means of lying about other people in the party, of uh, exactly. sabotaging other people's plans and programs, whatever it is, because they're on a moral mission and God help us from those who are on moral missions. And so this is the kind of thing that has to happen. Given these pitfalls that you have to face in this kind of an organization, it's amazing that the party has accomplished as much as it has. And of course, as we've discussed in this show many times, it's faced with all kinds of legal, legal obstacles that are put there by the Republicans and Democrats to keep third parties from growing. What we have to do in a nutshell, and this is not a complete answer, but this is all I'll give you for the moment, is to just keep getting the message out in whatever way we can with a radio broadcast like this, with you writing letters to the editor, with you calling into other radio shows, with you talking to your friends. And somewhere along the line, we are going to get bigger and broader, and, and we are, uh, obviously, over the years getting bigger and broader, even though that's not reflected necessarily in the Libertarian Party's membership. But somewhere along the line, this bigger and broader party is going to embrace people who have opportunities that you and I don't have to be able to do things that you and I can't do, either because of the money they have, the influence they have, the talents they have, the skills they have, the connections they have. And I can't tell you that this is going to succeed. All I can tell you is that the rewards are so great that I just can't see giving up trying. And I agree. I think that the Libertarian Party has been a positive force in, in American politics. And I do agree we are growing and getting bigger all the time. And, you know, it's interesting that, you know, what you were saying about, you know, malcontents and people who get into these groups, you know, um, I had a Libertarian Party here in San Joaquin County in California, and we're very small. We're trying to get really active. And, you know, I've talked to other Libertarians, and some of them, uh, you know, they, they find out that I'm a retiring uh, police officer. And, you know, I still am a Libertarian, even though I work in police work. <laughs> and they start this diatribe against me. Oh, yes. You know, and it's amazing. And, and it, I even said to one guy, you know, uh, how do you think this would make any converts to libertarians? And there's plenty of police that I work with that actually sure. are libertarians. Basically that, uh, you know, when you meet some people that uh, claim to be libertarians, some of the things they say and some, like you were saying, they're, they're basically almost like a fanaticism. It reminds me some of them, they're not really libertarians. I think they're, they're very strange. Some of them are, have the, the, I don't know, this fanaticism of a Bolshevik. I mean, it's bizarre. Sure. And, uh, you know, I was reading recently an article on the internet, it was quite an old one, by Justin Raimundo, uh, just absolutely slandering you and misrepresenting you for when you were on Bill Maher's Politically Incorrect. <laughs> and it amazes me, you know, he's supposed to say that he believes in the same things that most libertarians do, and, you know, I don't know what good all of that does. I mean, I'm not saying don't speak the truth and don't point out things that uh, people might believe in that are wrong, but after I read that, I thought, wow, you know, sometimes it makes you feel there's no hope for the movement, although I don't really believe that. Yes, well, I will say Raimundo was once in the Libertarian Party, and he left the party because of the kinds of things that you're talking about, and so... It soured him so badly that he became an outside-the-party malcontent and slandered, well, let me say slammed the Libertarian Party whenever he could. He eventually apologized to me for that article that you spoke of, and we seem to get along now, all right. But it's it was really just uh, indirectly caused by the very thing that you're talking about, and that is being in the party and having to put up with these people who are holier than thou. So anyway, let's just keep... Keeping on. Thanks Absolutely. so much, George. Thank you for all your hard work, Harry. Uh, patriotism. I appreciate your kind uh, comments and your gracious compliments. Thank you. Let's talk to Chris in Michigan. Good evening, Chris. I'm sorry to keep you waiting so long. Uh, that's no problem. Um, I wanted to first of all wish you a happy fourth, not Independence Day, but a happy fourth. Okay. Um, and uh, I wanted to... Well, I'm declaring my independence. <laughs> okay. And uh, I was reading an article at LouRockwell.com, mm -hmm. and it appears we had someone close to being a libertarian president once in a 20th century who was born on the 4th of July, and that was none other than Calvin Coolidge. Yes. Yeah, right. and um, this reading this article, I'll send you the link to um, email, but imagine an administration headed by a president who could equally appeal to liberals and conservatives alike with his minding my own business model. Personal liberty, you know, no government in your bedroom, economic liberty, no government in your pocketbook, real economic growth averaging 7% per year, which is like the highest growth on record, while inflation averaged only 0.4%, investment, manufacturing output, disposable income rising dra dramatically, and unemployment averaged only 3.3%. Yes, uh, Coolidge was not perfect, but he was certainly the best president we've had in the 20th and 21st centuries, and probably the second best was Warren Harding, and both of them have been maligned. Coolidge pretty much is a do-nothing president, yeah. and the idea that he said that the business of America is business, yeah. and as is quoted in that article that you speak of there, they give the whole quote, and I don't have it committed to memory, but he points out that everything that we want, the churches, the charities, the hospitals, all of these things have been created by the wealth that has been created by business, and so naturally the business of America is business, but of course people quote it out of context and just say the business of America is business as though he was just there to help his cronies in the business world, and of course Harding has been condemned because of the Teapot Dome scandal, which was really not 
nothing compared to Cheney and Halliburton or Truman and all of the problems that he had with the people in his cabinet. And all of those things are pretty much forgotten when Harding still lives on as the man who had the Teapot Dome scandal, which was something that happened in his administration. He fired the people who were involved in the scandal, something that Truman didn't do and something that Bush hasn't done. And Harding was a very, very good president. He said, again, I wish I had this committed to memory, but in his acceptance speech at the 1920 convention, he said, what America needs now is normalcy. No more crusades, no more legislation, no more seeking out to make a better world, but simply leaving people alone to make their own better world. And again, I'm paraphrasing. And unlike Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush and the Republicans of today, Harding meant it. And the size of the government decreased rapidly after Harding took office, and it continued to go on, go downward through the eight years of the Harding and Coolidge administrations. They were both very, very good presidents. Whether they were the greatest presidents we've ever had, I don't know, but certainly the best of the 20th century by far. Yeah, and I think one of the best aspects of it all is that at the end of um, Coolidge's term, 98% of Americans paid no income tax at all. Right. And we have been talking about government and the kind of society we once had in America. And Pierre, an American living in Canada, writes and asks, Why do libertarians relish the Constitution? If that document was so great, then surely we would have the limited government we once did. Well, the key there is once did. For about 100 years, the Constitution functioned quite well with the exception of the Civil War when the Constitution was trashed and Abraham Lincoln ran roughshod over the country, not just the South, but the North, closing down newspapers, closing down state legislatures and replacing them, creating new states, carving them out of old states without any congressional authority and without any constitutional authority. But otherwise, it functioned pretty well. But the problem with the Constitution was that it was not self-enforcing. And by that I mean that anyone who violated the Constitution did not automatically pay a penalty for it. There were no consequences of it. And so it relied on the good intentions of politicians. And that was the very thing that Jefferson had warned about. He had said, let us not then rely on the good intentions of men, but let us bind them down from mischief with the chains of the Constitution. And to a certain extent, that's what they did by setting the rules in the Constitution, saying this is what you're allowed to do and no more. But because, as I say, there were no consequences to be paid for violating it, eventually it would be violated. And once the floodgates opened, then, of course, everything just poured out. And what we have today are congressmen and presidents who believe that their power is unlimited, that there is absolutely nothing that they are not entitled to do. There is no issue so idiotic that some congressman won't introduce a bill about it. And there, of course, are no issues so idiotic that a president won't tell us what he thinks about them. In a State of the Union message, George W. Bush said that Major League Baseball must do something about steroids or the government will. Now, what in the world does the government have to do with how Major League Baseball runs its affairs? Absolutely nothing, we would think, but that's not what George Bush thinks. Pete in Knoxville writes to say, I'm sure you already know this, but the U.S. government's FDA has made it so very, very expensive to get a new medication on the market. It can cost $800 million for one, just one new medication. They have driven many of the smaller pharmaceutical companies out of business. If we were not to have the FDA, would health care costs go down? Oh, absolutely. Look at the computer business. So many of the companies that are giants in the industry now, like Apple Computer, for instance, were started on shoestrings. Apple was started in the garage by Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Uh, Bill Gates started with very, very little money, and now Microsoft is a multi, 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 multi multi-billion dollar company. Suppose that there was a federal computer agency that required all new companies, all new products to pass through the same kind of regulatory vetting that new medications go through. And it cost a half a billion to a billion dollars to get a new piece of software approved. Well, what would we have? We would have probably one company in this country producing computers and software, and that would be IBM. But, well, I shouldn't say that because given that kind of restricted environment, probably a few others like GE or General Motors would have gotten into the computer business. But the point is, of course, that it creates a limited market because it is too expensive for anybody else to get into. And coming back to the medication market, what we have is the inability of people who think that they know ways to cure cancer or cure AIDS or cure Alzheimer's or other things. They have no chance whatsoever to try out their products, to run tests, to do other things, because the FDA simply will uh, cost so much to, for their approval that it's, there's no hope whatsoever of these people who have these ideas to try to try them out. In the marketplace, many, many ideas fail. But because the marketplace is free and open, then other people do succeed and get through. And as a result, we have all of these things available to us. Imagine if the FDA were to just grant approval on all the products 
that we have in supermarkets. Oh, my God. So many new products that keep coming on the markets. And I love to shop in supermarkets. I do it in our family because I enjoy it so much. And I find new products. And I think, oh, wow, here's something good. And bring it home, and Pamela fixes it. And we haven't, uh, oh, wow, this is great. But suppose they had to spend half a billion dollars trying to get that product to, to market. We'd never see any of them. So, yes, drug costs would go way, way down because there would be so much more competition without the FDA. All right, let's get back to the telephones and talk with James in Oregon. Good evening, James. Uh, good evening, Harry. Uh, may I say right off the bat that um, I agree with the previous caller who said, well, basically you're the best thing to happen to Liberty since Thomas Jefferson. So, Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Please don't let that go to your head, though. Um... <laughs> Everything goes to my head. <laughs> um I'm calling uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, but um, uh, what you said earlier about the Constitution not being enforced, I think um, that that is probably the biggest problem in our country, is that politicians can actually uh, defy the Constitution and their oath of uh, oath to the Constitution and get away with it. It's sort of like if a thief, uh, if the only penalty for being a thief was that you had to give the stuff back if you were caught. Yeah, so that's thieves? a very good analogy. Yeah, well, this, this is what's happening to our country. I was just wondering, what, uh, the Libertarian Party platform doesn't really address this i mean they don't actually fly out say the constitution should be be enforced as law and there should be criminal penalties for any politician who uh breaks his oath to the constitution uh, is there any chance that well that's some... a, that's a very good point i hadn't thought about that uh, having that in the libertarian party's platform i don't know whether this has ever come up before whether somebody suggested it and it didn't make it it's very difficult to change the libertarian party platform that's true because it's based on certain principles that people consider to be unchanging, and so it isn't easy to change it. But I think you're on to something there. I think that that would be uh, something that not only should be a part of the platform, to say that as long as we're going to have a constitution in this country, there must be penalties for violating it, and those penalties must be built into the constitution so that they're not up to just the good intentions of one's fellows in Congress or so forth. Precisely, especially given that it's supposed to be the highest law in the land, yet it's the only law that is not enforced. Yes, and in addition to being a part of the LP platform, I think it makes a very good campaign issue, a good talking point. Uh, why don't we have penalties? When George Bush takes an oath to abide by the Constitution and uphold the Constitution and violates that, why doesn't he have to pay a penalty and give examples of it, such as putting uh, Jose Padilla in, in uh, prison and saying he's one of the bad guys so he doesn't have to have the privileges of the Bill of Rights? Yes, as you say, with specific jail terms or, at the worst, enormous fines like the kind that the FCC and SEC and other federal agencies impose upon private companies. Well, that's an idea, but um, basically when you violate in law the Constitution, if you pass a law that violates the Constitution, you're doing a whole world of damage, uh, sure. uh, an order of magnitude more than any petty criminal. So, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say fines. I'd say jail terms. Um, but <laughs> that's just me. Uh, uh, I also wanted to mention uh, something completely uh, non-secretorial, if that's a word. Um, Ralph Nader makes the very good point that in 1886, some judge somewhere said that a corporation was a person in law. Uh, that draws a lot of people uh, in terms of voters because it makes a lot of sense. It's totally absurd. A lot of people realize it. Do you see any chance that the Lib Libertarian Party could uh, take a position on that? Well, I haven't really thought about it. These are tough questions. I'm a tough question kind of guy. <laughs> I really don't have anything to say on it. I've spoken, of course, on corporations before. We've had people call in who say that the concept of limited liability is a problem, that individual shareholders should be liable for a lot of things that the corporation does. But, in fact, I don't agree with that because the, the whole concept of limited liability is that you are telling people that your personal fortune is not at stake here, and if you don't want to do business with me under those circumstances, you have the right not to do business with me. But if you do, you understand that if I go bankrupt, you can't come and seize my car and my home and my wife and my children and so on. I, I feel very strongly about the concept of limited liability. I think it's a good thing. In any event, I the idea of whether corporations should be treated as persons is just something I haven't thought about, so I'm drawing a blank here. Well, I hope Mr. Bednarik is listening to the show. Maybe he's getting some ideas. Um, like I said, that does draw a lot of people because a lot of people do not think that corporations should be treated as, as persons. Stay on the line while we take a quick break here, sure. and then tell me when we come back what would be the ramifications of that, because I'm not sure what this means in terms of actual practical consequences. So There's a little mini war going on now where corporations are fighting for all the civil liberties or the, <clears throat> uh, the, the Bill of Rights. They want all of them for themselves. Uh, in other words, they want the freedom of speech. They want the, the freedom to lobby Congress, which is a biggie, because right now the only people really lobbying Congress are corporations with the money to do so. Um, we are uh, essentially, he's saying that corporations should not be considered people. Or uh, I, I see what you're saying. Well, of course, this is a misreading of the whole concept of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights doesn't say that people should have the right to speak freely, to attend the church of their choice, to assemble and to print whatever they want. It says Congress shall make no law. 
respecting the freedom of religion or the freedom of the press or whatever it is. So it doesn't matter whether you treat a corporation as a person or as some kind of just mythical legal entity. It still comes back to the fact that Congress shall pass no law. And pass no law against corporations, pass no law against people, pass no law against churches, pass no law against organizations, pass no law against whatever you want to call them. Am I making myself clear? Well, wh- uh, wh- what about corporate lobbying of government? Should they be allowed to lobby government? Well, any time... The government, the legislators, have the ability to put you out of business or to reward you, you're going to have lobbyists. And if you pass a law against corporate lobbyists, then what you're going to see suddenly is a tremendous expansion of individual lobbyists, lobbying on behalf of individuals. But, of course, somehow or other, they're going to be paid by corporations, but they're going to be doing it as individuals. Because any time the legislature has the power to set all these rules, then, of course, people in their own self-interest are going to be lobbying. And they may be lobbying to get special advantages. They may be lobbying for their own survival to protect themselves against being put out of business by new laws. And you have both kinds of lobbying going on in Washington, lobbying for advantage and lobbying for self-preservation. So if you want an end to lobbying, then simply restrict the government to its constitutional functions and you'll see all of the K Street companies closing up shop and going back to producing socks or shoes or something else because there will no longer be any reason to lobby. Well, that's that's a good point. Um, I myself would like to see uh, only individuals, human beings, uh, have the ability to lobby government myself. Corporations don't compete with individuals on a, on a level playing field. They have all sorts of resources that we don't have. And anyway, that, that, that is a little mini war uh, that's, that's going on. Well, and as P.J. O'Rourke has said, and I've quoted it many times in the show because it is so perceptive. It, it's that, not, it's that not when, the power to abuse. It's no, no, that's Michael Cloud. Oh, okay. P.J. O'Rourke's remark was that when the legislature has the power to set the rules for buying and selling, the first things to be bought and sold will be the legislators. That's true. Uh, and so what you have to do is to take away from the legislators the power to set the rules for buying and selling, and then the corporations will no longer see any reason to do any lobbying at all. Well, that's a very good point. Uh, uh, can I say, say one more thing? Before okay, we, we got about one minute before we go to a break, so let's have it quickly. Okay, uh, one of the most profound, poignant, um, wonderful things you've ever said, uh, and I, I hope you're remembered for this forever. Um, everyone should remember that what it, uh, you said this in Why Government Doesn't Work. The, 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 um, everything the government does, is it does at the point of a gun. I think any time you answer a libertarian question, you should start with, do you realize that everything that the government does, it does at the point of a gun? That has helped me so many times in so many libertarian arguments. I can't tell you. Well, it changes the complexion of of any discussion because people do not pay attention to that. And when you call it to their attention, when you say, well, who should we force to pay for this? What what family should be required to give up what they want to do for their family, their children, and so on, and pay for this in order to be able to do what you want to do? Which people should be sent to jail if they don't agree with this? And things of this sort. Then people do find themselves having to look at this in a little different light. If you can gently remind somebody that you're talking with that whatever government program he wants, whatever law he wants, he's talking about forcing people. And really, in the final analysis at the point of a gun, the only reason you don't see the gun is because you have chosen to obey the edict coming down from the government. And when people realize that force is involved in everything that they suggest that the government should do, they begin to look at it a little differently. Most people do. And this is just one of many different techniques that you can use to diffuse a situation where you seem to be at loggerheads with somebody else, where he believes this, you believe that. But there are a number of ways that you can soften those barriers between you and begin to get people to come around to your point of view. One of the important ways is to realize that you may have a difference about a specific issue, but in the final analysis, you both want the same thing, and that is the liberty to control your own life, the freedom to make your own decisions. And while I'm talking about Clint's uh, email from Tulsa, he says, two weeks ago, a caller on the Bortz show, Neil Bortz in Atlanta, said that uh, he was against the U.S. going into Iraq, which, of course, caused Bortz to butcher him. One of the many justifications that he blasted the caller for, caller with, uh, was that it was moral for the U.S. to go to Iraq, and that the proof of that was because the U.S. probably would not have won the war against the British, the Revolutionary War, had we not sought the help of the French. The caller didn't know how to respond to that, so he hung up on the caller. I ask you, what kind of an answer can you give to respond to that kind of reasoning? Well, just because the French decided to help the Americans for reasons that were good for the French in the French eyes does not mean the U.S. is obligated to go to anybody's help. The French didn't do it because they were altruistic and wanted to help America. They did it because they saw this as an opportunity to cause problems for the British, who were their mortal enemies at that time. The British and the French had beaucoup uh, wars over the centuries. They were just natural enemies, and it was only in the 20th century that they became allies. And so the fact that the French decided to help America is no reason to feel that America is obligated to help anybody. The French did it for their self-interest, and we should worry about the self-interest of America. What has happened by the United States having troops all over the world, by interfering in all sorts of disputes between other countries, between governments and revolutionary movements in countries, is that billions of people in the world now fear the United States, and we fear the rest of the world. And so obviously 
going to Iraq is not going to make that any better. All right, enough of that. Let's go to New Orleans now and talk with Jeffrey. Good evening, Jeffrey. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting so long. That's all right, because I have a very sad report to give you concerning one of your competitive parties, the Constitution Party. I had hoped that it could have been a party that I could have joined being a pro-lifer and so on, but unfortunately they violated Article 6, Section 3 of the Constitution, which says that no religious test shall be required for anyone running for any public office of any kind. What they've done in their preamble is to say that the members of the Constitution Party believe that Jesus Christ is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and Ruler of America. And although they state that they don't want religious tests, they narrowly apply to say that we don't attack specific Christian denominations. The point being that the CP has, in fact, um, shown themselves to be hypocrites in this regard. And in other areas, they've shown to be giving problems by advocating going back to Article 1, Section 2, and Article 1, Section 9, where the taxes will be collected directly by the states, and money will be sent in proportion to the population, to the government, and that they will use protective tariffs and duties, as they call it, to try to control trade. Now, we all know what that means in terms of what, it'll, uh, for what it brought on in terms of the Civil War, because the government can selectively use tariffs to dictate how you spend your money. Yes, there are two kinds of tariffs. They are called revenue tariffs and protective tariffs. A revenue tariff is putting a tax on imports solely for the purpose of helping to finance the government. And that might be a 1%, 2%, even 5% tax, in effect, on any goods coming into the country. A protective tariff is put on selected items coming into the country for the purpose of protecting domestic industries or to try to get domestic in- industries to flourish, and they are imposed in, in a very, very political way. And so a protective tariff is just out of the question in a free country. A revenue tariff might be perhaps the best way to finance what small functions of government the people think are necessary. Well, on top of that, of course, we have the problem of excise taxes where the government tells you what luxuries are and what luxuries are not, and that has a similar effect in the domestic area. Oh, definitely, and, and perhaps the worst of that we have seen with cigarettes that states like California and New York have just put prohibitive taxes on cigarettes, and of course the result of that is you have an enormous black market in cigarettes where people buy cigarettes in Maryland or some other state that has much lower taxes, and then uh, actually Maryland's a poor example, North Carolina is a good example, and then they truck them up to New York and they sneak them into liquor stores and other places in New York so people can buy cigarettes at a much smaller price than would be warranted by the New York tax. And speaking of that, you pointed out how the government uh, is jacking up the price of medicine. Well, I'm going to remind you that because of government control over the market for blind people to try to buy computers, the cost of computers for blind people is from $2,600 to $3,600 because the talking programs for blind folks are regulated by the government and the companies that manufacture them have to make deals with the state agencies for the blind so that they dictate who gets the computers and who doesn't get the computers and the result is that the prices remain jacked up. Well, one more example of, of how the people who are the object of the government's beneficence sometimes get cut in half. Handicapped people, if I may use that term, I'm not sure what we're supposed to call the uh, people who have disabilities this week, but handicapped people are some of the people who are hurt the worst by the Americans with Disabilities Act and other federal regulations. For example, uh, I know a landlord, a, a company in Michigan, that builds enormous apartment houses and manages those apartment houses, and they are now facing an enormous suit from the federal government because not all of the rooms in the apartment complex are outfitted for handicapped people. If they are to do this, it means that not only will people who are not handicapped have to pay more for their apartments uh, for things that they don't need, but the people who are handicapped who could use the few handicapped apartments that would be appropriate are going to wind up paying more also. There is no friend in Washington. There is nobody there that's going to help you in Jeffrey, I know that you are legally blind, and so you have faced this for many, many years, and you know far better than I do that government is not your buddy. And not only that, but it takes away the responsibility for helping oneself away from the handicapped person so the handicapped person doesn't take charge of his life. Yeah, how true. Jeffrey, I appreciate your call. I'm always glad to hear from you, and stay in touch. We will. Let's go now to Maine and talk with Ed. Good evening, Ed. Harry, I'm not worthy. You're not worthy? (laughs) Oh, get off the phone then. No, I'm not telling you. (laughs) You know, know, I, I can define... Uh, conservative and liberal, because I got my definition from Walter E. Williams, and I can define uh, libertarian. But do you know what a progressive is? Because I can't think. <laughs> I, 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 I think that's a kind of dinner where you go from one house to the other, isn't it? Is that what it is? Yeah, I think so. Progressive dinner is not what that is. You know, all these people in Maine who are calling and, and they're calling me a progressive, even though I keep telling them no, I'm not a progressive. <laughs> I'm a regressive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a libertarian. You know? Yeah. How uh, how does Walter Williams define conservative and liberal? A conservative is one who conserves the limitations of government as set forth in Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution. And a liberal is one who... That'll be the day. Go ahead. (laughs) Okay. And a liberal is one who liberally interprets the last clause of Article 1, Section 9 to do anything you want, to make the government as big as you want, with the so-called expansion clause. Yeah. Which which really only applies to logistics, to, you know, to help out with with whatever is allowed in it. What did I say? Section 9? I mean, Article 1, Section 8. Right. I'm sorry. 
Well, uh, years, years, yeah, years ago, I defined conservatives and liberals this way, I, I, and I believe this is still true, basically, is that a conservative is someone who is skeptical of change, and a liberal is someone who is impatient with the status quo. And this does tend to define what conservatives and liberals were a few decades ago. But what has happened, and I've discussed this before on the show, is that the party system has created a situation where people are just throwing away their principles right and left, so that now what we have are conservatives who just embrace any kind of change. Oh, we're going to go invade other countries? Fine, as long as it's a Republican who doing it. Oh, we're going to have a, a brand new health care system? Uh, terrific, as long as it's a Republican president who presents it. And um, in the same way, with the liberals, uh, they will support Bill Clinton in anything that he wants to do, uh, even get rid of or, or supposedly reform welfare, even though they didn't really reform it, uh, as long as it's a Democratic president that's doing it. And so the conservatives and liberals just don't mean anything anymore as far as terms are concerned. But of course, libertarians, maybe just because we're not in power, uh, do mean something. A liberal a libertarian is somebody who believes in individual liberty, personal responsibility, and much, 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 much smaller government. And we don't have enough time on this show for me to have all the muches that would really define what a libertarian is. That's what I'm talking about. This is why I listen to the Harry Brown Show. Let me take some emails in this time that we have left. One from Eric, who says he's reading my Complete Guide to Swiss Banks, written back in 1976. And he wonders how much things might have changed in Switzerland they, since I wrote that book 25 years ago. I mentioned there that they have a tradition of private property and privacy that is a much greater protection than even the law. And he asks if I think they've caved in since they're now members of the UN, for example. Have they too succumbed to the disease of big government? Well, I haven't been very close to Switzerland for a good many years now, so I can't speak contemporaneously about it. But I know that the tradition is so much stronger there than it is in this country that whatever happens here is going to happen there a number of years later, just as whatever happens in Europe doesn't happen here until a number of years later. He also says, you mentioned that they speak French and German in Switzerland. Does this mean that they had once been the people that fled those two countries? I don't know how that came about, but there are actually four language districts in Switzerland, French, German, Italian, and a Latin language called Romanche, which is kind of a combination of Latin and German. And I lived in Zurich, the German section, for six years and loved it there from about 1976 to 1983. And I took a lot of lessons, but mein Deutsch is sehr schlecht. Also, mon François est très mal. And me Italiano is molto maladicio. And Pierre, who wrote about the Constitution earlier, says, just who exactly do you think would enforce any penalties for politicians violating the Constitution? I think the only way to rake usurpers of the Constitution over the coals would be to strip them of parliamentary immunity and to allow private citizens to sue politicians if their proposed unconstitutional bill became law. Well, that's a good point, and there probably are several possibilities. It's not something I've given a lot of thought to beyond just simply recognizing that if there are no consequences to a politician, then sooner or later they're going to violate it. And a message from Eric in Michigan. I'm really interested in your opinions on Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11. I'm sorry, I have only heard about it on television shows and seen some snippets from it, but I have not seen it in the theater. Eric says, I saw it last week and found it very moving, but I'm afraid that most viewers will watch it and think it's time to vote for John Kerry. For me, the message of Fahrenheit 9-11 is that government's foreign policy got us into this situation. Whether Bush or Kerry are in office, we'll continue to have these problems because we'll continue to meddle in foreign affairs. Very, very good point, and I do want to see it at some point. Well, that's all the time we have this week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron Armstrong, for taking care of everything in Washington. And please join me again next week at this time, and let's do this again. This is Harry Brown. Good night.